Hello on full person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the recent updates about Jupiter and some of its moons. And specifically, we're going to discuss some of the discoveries about the iconic giant red spot of Jupiter and the discoveries from Io, Ganymede and Europa. And let's actually start with the iconic feature that I think everyone is familiar with. The massive storm, or really the biggest storm in the solar system, that you see featured right here in a time lapse taken by the Voyager 1. And the thing is, we've known about this spot since 1600s, with some of the first detailed description being done by the famous Giovanni Cassini back in 1665. And here you can even see the images he drew back in 1677, 1690, and 1691. And though obviously back then he didn't refer to it as the Great Red Spot, Cassini and a lot of other astronomers around the same time Notice that this was a continuous and persistent storm that he essentially referred to as a permanent spot. But we know that even back in 1632, or up to 60 years earlier, German Abbott used his telescope to see the same spot as well. So this permanent spot very likely existed in the same location for at least 100 years. But then after Cassini, for nearly 120 years, nobody seems to have noticed it or it potentially disappeared. And so it actually wasn't until 1800s that we saw the spot again. Here the astronomer Samuel Heinrich Schwab was the first to once again observe the structure in a very similar location to where Cassini saw it as well. And so here there was obviously a bit of a mystery. Was this the same storm or was this a new storm that was formed in the 1800s? And well in essence the study by Agustin Sanchez La Vega and his team that you can find in the description and he essentially tries to understand what's actually happening here and come to some kind of a conclusion. And they do this by measuring the sizes and the movements deduced from various images and from various descriptions in the past, coming to a conclusion that it's extremely unlikely that what we're observing and what Cassini observed is the same spot. In other words, their conclusion is that we're actually observing a new spot that must have formed in the last 200 years. And the spot must have disappeared for over a hundred years after the last observations by Cassini. And so sometimes between mid-18th and 19th century, there might have been no spot whatsoever. But it then reappeared and has been present on the surface for at least 190 years. And so here they basically suggest that this is a dynamic spot, but it just doesn't change as fast as similar storms on Neptune or Saturn. But here, based on their observations, they definitely suggest it changed dramatically. Back in 1879, it must have been at least 40,000 kilometers long. But it's now only 14,000 kilometers, or approximately one-third of the size. And previously, it was much longer and more stretched, now it's a lot more rounder. And even based on the observations in the last 50 years, based on, for example, the Voyager probe pictures, we know that it actually shrunk quite dramatically ever since then. And so even in the last 50 years, it decreased in size quite dramatically. And this is very likely because of the way it seems to be formed. Here the proposal is that the great spot seems to be generated by a very long cell resulting from the south tropical disturbance, combined with a lot of smaller storms that seem to be absorbed inside of it. And so essentially by feeding the great red spot more of these smaller storms, it's able to maintain its size and it's also able to increase in size. Yet without these additional vortices, in various simulations it actually seems to shrink in size in just three years. And so in other words, the storm seems to be shrinking because overall Jupiter doesn't have as many storms of smaller sizes. In other words, it seems to be just a little bit more calm and is getting calmer and calmer in the last 50 years. But obviously exactly how it forms in the beginning and why it seems to have disappeared in the 1800s is currently unknown. But what seems to be almost definite now is that it's not the same storm as the one seen by Cassini. So it might actually exist for about 200 years, then disappear and then reappear again. It might be some kind of a climatic change or some kind of a cycle we still don't understand, but that's the main conclusion from the recent paper you can find in the description. Then we also got a lot of really cool studies and a lot of cool images of the Jupiter's Io, the beautiful volcanic moon that has been recently captured by the Juno mission several times. And though some of the most impressive pictures have been taken by Juno so far, we now have some of the first incredible pictures taken by a ground telescope as well. This is the large binocular telescope on Mount Graham and it was recently able to capture 
this. And here the detail is absolutely incredible. It actually shows us some of the plume deposits and various eruption deposits from Pilan Patera, which include dark lava and white sulfurous dioxide. And that's on top of the recent map that actually shows us all of the volcanoes on the surface of Io. Here this new map shows us various locations where magma has erupted recently, including 87 previously unknown spots, which were discovered in various images in the last couple of years. Some of them came from the Juno mission, and some of them came from these ground observations. And more intriguingly, researchers have even discovered an extremely recent eruption that must have formed in the last 27 years. Here you can actually see a volcano that was not present in the Galileo pictures, but is now visible in the Juno images. And this is about 60 by 90 kilometers across, so this is a huge volcano. But when it comes to these volcanoes, there is maybe just one major mystery. We still have no idea how they're produced or even what type of volcanoes they are. In other words, we have no idea how volcanism manifests on the surface of Io. But we do have some really incredible images and even simulations showing us some of the most detailed observations of some of these volcanoes. And this is essentially what we think they might look like. All of them. In other words, they're not your typical volcanoes with the lava spewing from the center. Instead, a lot of them seem to actually resemble lava lakes consisting of a ring around the lake where the liquid lava comes out and where it becomes visible. In other words, it's almost like some kind of a reverse volcano from what we usually see on planet Earth. Here, all of the center is the hardened crust and there's a lake underneath this, but the lake here is surrounded by relatively high walls, which in essence form a kind of a bowl shape. And so around this bowl, a lot of lava seems to break through some of these walls occasionally, forming a very hot ring visible right here. We actually do see this sometimes on planet Earth as well, especially in locations like Hawaii. But unlike on planet Earth, these volcanoes are enormous. Here a typical wall is hundreds of meters in height, which is why this lava doesn't really flow out of the volcano and instead seems to move really slowly. But during these volcanic eruptions, it can cause these lakes to go up and down, which can occasionally break the edges, resulting in the lava flow around the perimeter. And so in essence this seems to be the main type of volcanism on the surface of this moon. But apart from explaining volcanoes, researchers have also discovered a lot of additional features, including potentially previously unseen 7 km tall mountains, and obviously a lot of color changes because of relatively recent eruptions. But when it comes to Io, because this is such a dynamic moon, we'll definitely be talking more about this relatively soon, because I'm sure even more things will be discovered with additional Juno observations. Then we also had some really exciting discoveries about Ganymede, and specifically trying to figure out why it has these unusual stripes, and also what must have happened in the past in order to create certain features on the surface. And so in one of the recent papers, researchers were able to bulk a lot of these stripes into three categories, based on when they were created, either a long time ago, or intermediate age terrain, or recent terrain. And here the main discovery was that all of the ancient terrain and intermediate terrain must have been formed as a result of tidal interactions. In other words, many of these stripes were very likely the result of a slightly elliptical orbit, so the orbit of Ganymede was not perfectly circular. But a lot of the newer features and a lot of the newer stripes cannot be explained by this model and seem to have some kind of a mysterious origin. And that's because nowadays Ganymede's orbit is relatively circular. So there seems to be some kind of a different process responsible for some of the formations on the surface. But this stripe mystery actually leads us to the next study that kind of explains what must have happened billions of years ago. Based on surface observations and additional features found in this region right here, Researchers also discovered that there must have been an enormous collision here with an object approximately 150 kilometers in diameter. And it was this collision that very likely redistributed a lot of mass around Ganymede, most likely causing Ganymede to assume the elliptical orbit, possibly changed its orientation and naturally completely changed the surface of the entire moon. This would have been an enormous impact causing tremendous destruction that would actually melt everything on the surface for quite some time. And this is believed to be very similar to what very likely happened on Pluto as well, where a very large impact created Sputnik Planitia. There it also caused Pluto to reorient itself and changed its surface dramatically. But at the moment 
This is the remnants of one of the largest impacts we've ever seen in a solar system. Not the largest, as a matter of fact the impact on Mars might have been a little bit larger and you can learn about this in one of the videos in the description, but at 150 kilometers this was huge. And last but not least we have Europa. The moon that we're going to be visiting very soon and the moon that the scientists are really excited about because there are a lot of studies suggesting there might be life underneath the surface. And that's because we believe there is a huge ocean underneath. But it was always unknown how thick the ice shell actually is. As a matter of fact, depending on the thickness, maybe the life here isn't even possible. But by using some of the observations of various craters created by previous collisions, scientists were able to use modeling techniques to figure out the very likely thickness of the shell and thus come up with some conclusions. Here, by looking at various craters containing concentric rings, they realized that these types of rings can only be created if the ice contains certain thickness and certain consistency. And so here, Shigeru Wakita and his team were able to basically calculate what's known as total plastic strain. They simulated potential collisions on the surface, discovering what would create these types of rings. And their conclusion is that the ice is about 20 kilometers thick. Because anything thinner, less than 15 kilometers, results in compression tectonics that do not produce same rings. But anything thicker than 20 kilometers would produce observed ring structures. And that's because in order to form these rings, we have to have specific thickness and thermal structure of the ice. Here you can actually see the image of these rings in the Kalanish and Tyre craters. And so this can only be formed in relatively thick ice. And the top part of the ice has to be relatively hard. So here we have 6 to 8 kilometers of relatively hard ice shell with at least 12 kilometers of much warmer, much more liquid ice. And so surprisingly this is not so different from what we find on Earth but usually in the oceans. The thickness of the crust and the more liquid asthenosphere is very similar. But because it's so thick it obviously means it provides a lot of protection for anything underneath. And so if there is an ocean underneath, and right now there are a lot of hints that there is one, it would provide a lot of protection for any life existing inside. And more importantly, it would protect this life from Jupiter's radiation. And so that's actually good news for any possible life that might exist inside Europa. But the bad news is obviously that, since the size is so thick, it will be extremely challenging for us to drill through this in order to one day discover if there is really life and in order to explore the oceans underneath. Now obviously drilling 20 kilometers is something that is possible, but it just would be super difficult. Nevertheless, this basically suggests there is a high chance for life to survive inside, mostly because it would be completely sheltered from everything. And all of this based on the observations of these concentric rings formed by ancient craters on the surface of Europa. But at least for now, that's pretty much all we have. And we'll probably not be covering Jupiter until the end of the year, so if you'd like to find out about other discoveries from 2024, check out the previous video in the description. On that note, well, thank you for watching, we'll definitely discuss Jupiter again sometimes in 2025, but until then, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.